Well, thank you very much indeed for that warm welcome. I'm going to justify the fact that I'm going to sit down for quite a lot of the time, mainly because looking at my height, I'm in remarkable proximity to the beam above me, um, which feels rather oppressive. So I will probably sit down. But I'm also going to give you a, a thoroughly dramatic reason for doing so, because I'm going to talk about Dr. Faustus, who is revealed sitting in his study. So I'm going to do my best to emulate Dr. Faustus, at least for some of the time. Um, so if you don't mind, I will sit down, but I might stand up and leap about, uh, you know, occasionally when I become impassioned. Um, I think that what I wanted to do today was to say a little bit about Christopher Marlowe. As you probably know, I'm the chairman of the Marlowe Society, and uh, that's a, a very interesting role to fulfil. And some years ago, we, we had a conference at Kingston, uh, where we talked about Marlowe and Shakespeare, and one of the researchers described Shakespeare as Marlowe's PhD student, and I rather liked that, uh, so I might go along with that for the rest of my career. Um, but I, I'm particularly interested in the fact that, you know, in 1587, at your theatre, uh, Marlowe created a sensation with Tamblin. It was the talk of the town, if you like, the most spectacular success. And I'd like to try and talk about why that was, but also why he is such a great playwright. But before I go into the detail of Marlowe, I just want to say one thing. He, when you say playwright, you have to remember that the word is spelt P-L-A-Y-W-R-I-G-H-T, meaning a maker of plays, not a writer of plays. And the problem with poor old Marlowe has been that most people waffle on about his ability with blank verse, the fact he invented, you know, the decasyllabic line, or may have done. Uh, and they talk about his wonderful language all the time, very often overlooking the fact that what really, I think, account of his success, where he was a great maker of plays. And nothing more so than the fact that he was beginning to make use of what were the first real purpose-built professional playhouses, of which you represent the most important, possibly. Uh, and so, you know, we're talking about an age when there had never been permanent professional playhouses before, and suddenly here there are, here they are. And a, a real playwright, a maker of plays, will not only exploit such buildings, but will also write plays that will help to shape the future of such buildings. But at the same time, a playwright of this calibre must be able also to write a play that can be performed in what we now call a found space, because once you know, a play had been performed at The Rose, that was not the end of its life. It had what Jonathan Miller called an afterlife, and that may well have been in some country inn. It may well have been in a court art as we have here, because as you probably know, most histories of the theatre, this inn is the illustration they usually choose to show the similarity between Elizabethan Playhouse and Elizabethan Inn. So you're sitting in the very spot where, who knows, <coughs> some of these found spaces may have happened. So it's that kind of I interest I want to look at. There are a number of things that have prompted me to do this. Um, I don't want to bore people who've heard this before, but my first encounter with Marlowe was as a drama student in the 1950s, uh, where I just fell in love with uh, the fact that it was, to me, a kind of visceral, passionate drama that I'd never encountered before. And as an actor, it was so rewarding and so uh, insightful into the human psyche that I found myself immediately wanting to spend my life in Marlowe. And it's interesting, a few year, years ago, that's many years after my first encounter, I was invited by the King's School in Canterbury, which is the school that Marlowe attended, I live in Canterbury, by the way, so I'm, you know, I, I bring Marlowe in my bones, as it were. The King's School in Canterbury is where Marlowe went to school, and I was invited to judge their public speaking or oratory competition. Um, I, I, I did not, knew nothing about it, except I knew there were four houses, one of which was called Marlowe, and it, said it was the competitors from Marlowe House who actually won the competition. But what I noticed on a brochure that was given me was that the, the competition was founded in 
uh, I think it was 1382. So by the time Marlowe was there, it was well established. And it, was, it is very, very clearly documented that the King's School was a great place where plays were performed and read. And apparently the headmaster of the King's School had a finer collection of books than any other place in the country, including the two universities. So Marlowe had uh, access to some of the greatest plays in world dramatic literature, uh, even as a boy. The thing that I found very interesting is that um, if you think of a play like The Massacre at Paris, which is a, a sort of scrappy play, which I was involved with the production of it in Canterbury Cathedral a few years ago, um, that play is generally agreed to be a slightly corrupt text. The text seems... You know, the places, for example, where it's inconsistent, where obviously the person who started off writing it forgot what was coming, coming next, or, and so on. And it's clearly cobbled together by, from the memories of actors. That's what it seems. But it, it's a very much an actor's play. That's what I'm fascinated by. Any play. And, and if you see The Massacre at Paris or work on The Massacre at Paris, you just feel these are actors working. You feel the man who created this play was not someone who wrote someone and said, off you go, do that. He was someone who knew the theatre from the very inside. And I think that's absolutely fascinating when you think how uh, these plays may, may have been passed on by word of mouth rather than in written forms at some stage. The other thing I want to say, just by turn of general introduction before we look at some detail, is that the whole process of writing a play is dependent upon your understanding of the theatre. And I often find myself, for my sins, because I've had a sort of modest uh, career as a playwright, being asked to judge playwriting competitions. And I read these plays, I mean, hundreds of them, <laughs> hundreds of them come in, people because hundreds of people think they can write plays. Interesting, you might be to know the latest statistic from my publisher is that one in every 600 plays submitted will be published, and that's considered to be generous. So you look at these plays, and I think, have you ever been in a theatre? <laughs> have you ever thought what you're asking of the theatre when you write that? You know, plays where a three-bedroom terrace house is on stage for about two minutes, immediately to be substituted by a street outside in heavy traffic, to be followed by a scene in an underground section. I mean, have they really been in a theatre? They know how it works. They know what a theatre feels like, how you operate it. I mean, it is fascinating that, you know, and it is that kind of knowledge of theatre from the inside that is going to make a play. Right? How Marlowe precisely acquired this, of course, we don't actually know. But we do, what we do know is that by the time he had graduated and, and immediately graduated from Cambridge with his degree, after some dodgy business about being refused his degree because he'd been involved in spying activities, um, he produces two blockbusters. You know, Tamblyn Part 1, which is so successful that they want Tamblyn Part 2 almost immediately. So, I mean, that, that's pretty good going. I wish my career had been like that. <laughs> so let's think a little about some of the things that make these great plays. I, I, I've chosen five characteristics of Marlowe's playwriting as it fits in a theatre building, and then we'll see. Well... I said I was going to justify my sitting here. The beginning of Dr. Faustus is, is a very fascinating prologue in which uh, on comes a chorus figure talking about the muse, talking about this character, Dr. Faustus, that the play is going to be about. And then at the very end, he simply says, and this the man that in his study sits. In other words, ta-da, here he is. Now, what does that tell us about the way that play began? Faustus is already there. Here's the, here he is, already sitting at his desk. And then, I think fascinatingly, he says, settle thy studies, Faustus. 
which could be an actor's cue for closing his book and standing up coming forward because if he was revealed sitting in what we call, might like to call the discovery space, which I'll talk about in a minute, then he doesn't want to stay there to act the scene. He wants to come out of his discovery space. Okay, so let's think about this word discovered. We find this word peppered amongst many plays in the Elizabethan age. Uh, we get three very fine examples in Marlowe. There's first of all this where Marlowe uh, introduces Dr. Faustus. But then we have this extraordinary uh, discovery in Dido, Queen of Carthage, which some people think was an earlier play, some people think was a later play. No one's ever agreed whether this... But here, here it goes. Here the curtains draw, and there is discovered Jupiter dandling Ganymede upon his knee and Mercury lying asleep. So in other words, at the very beginning of the play, at two plays, begin with figures already in situ in what must have been some form of discovery space we think at the back of the stage. So your Rose Theatre, I think, must have had a discovery space of some kind. And the discovery space is, is, is frequently used in Shakespeare as well. You, know, you probably remember right at the end of um, his career, Shakespeare wrote The Tempest, where, OK... Miranda and Ferdinand are discovered playing chess, for example. In other words, you know, that, that was probably at the Blackfriars Theatre, of course, which is a different design altogether. But the fact is that the Rose almost certainly must have had somewhere where characters could have been revealed. But the, the genius of using the discovery space is that it creates the impression that the story's already begun. You know, oh, it's all been going on. You know, and so you, you drop into the action of the play uh, and, and realise that the story's already underway. Uh, and here are the characters. Now, there is a third example of that, um, and that is in Tamberlin, where, which, of course, is the, the first play that we know was performed at the Rose. So this may have been the first ever use of the discovery space. Um, in Tamberlin, Xenocrate, who is the, uh, the daughter of the Soldan of, uh, of Damascus, horribly relevant, that play. I'll talk about that in a moment because it's all about massacres in Syria and about the Muslim world in conflict with the Christian world, in conflict with the Jewish world, in conflict with a tyrant. And it's all about people being forced into marriage, about massacres. It's thrilling, chilling stuff. And remember, perhaps, a play written shortly after the publication of the first ever World Atlas. So at last you have a playwright who can actually look and see what the world really looks like. If you've ever looked at old World Atlases, there's a wonderful um, museum in Antwerp full of atlases. And if you look at the atlases that were published sort of before Marlowe was alive, that they, for start, they show Jerusalem in the middle of the world, of course, uh, and they are fi they're just pure fancy, fancy. They bear no resemblance to the, the geography that we know it. But about two years before Marlowe graduated, the first ever world atlas was published that actually looks remarkably like the world we know. So in that play, anyway, Xenocrate, uh, who has married Tamberlin, the great tyrant who rules the world, um, I don't know what you know about Tamberlin, he still recognised as a hero in one of the Istans, Tajikistan, I think. But someone will correct me. But there he is, he's worshipped, he, there's a statue to him, Timur the Lame he was known as, but Tamburlaine, this man who swept across the world, massacring, murdering, killing emperors, killing virgins, killing whole cities, uh, conquering the world, playing off 
emperors against empresses, playing off superpowers against superpowers, bragging, boasting, strutting about, bellowing. Uh, Xenocrity, his wonderful bride, dies. And the death of Xenocrity is the, the, the first moment in the play where the curtains draw to reveal her on her deathbed. It's a very moving moment. It is incidentally also one of the great moments, and I'll be coming back to that, where music is used. So the use of the discovery space, the inner space within the theatre, is very, very important in all of Marlowe's plays, and he exploits it absolutely brilliantly. But let's move on. The other thing that we say about uh, the, those theatres is that they were fascinating in their uses of entrances and exits. Because suddenly we now have uh, stages which can represent the world because of their size and their openness. They're not the little platforms of medieval drama. They're not the little mansions of that time. These are spaces with access from doors, possibly, possibly at the rear of the theatre, which enable free movement across the big space. They're not stages with wings, which are an absolute disaster for trying to do big battle scenes, because you have to walk in sideways <laughs> to be seen. What you want, if you want to do a battle scene or great forces movement, is as much flexibility as that in that big open space as you can possibly get. And so if you look at, and I'll give you some examples here, if you look at some of the entrances and the things that people say in the plays, um, you'll see how movement, these huge sweeps of movement, um, are represented by some of the stage directions. For example, in the Jew of Malta, there it several times says exit on the one side and on the other. Or it says exuant severally, everyone going out. Incidentally, if people paid more attention to how people went off stage, they, they would get much, far better productions. Uh, very often people are very good at coming on, but not so good at going off. Um, the funny thing was, when I was a drama student, we were very, very old-fashioned drama school, and we were taught how to come into a, a, a room, uh, because it was always assumed this place we would be in would have canvas flats with doors in them, and we were taught how to open the door without the flat wobbling, as it looked as though it was made of canvas. Well, I mean, nowadays it's incredible to think of that, but there you go. Um, if you think of the, of the way that people came on and went off, uh, there's lots and lots of occasions when it says, alarms within, and then they all go belting off in all sorts of directions. If you look at, for example, the opening of the King Edward II, he's fearsome play about a homosexual affair and, and the corruption of power, it begins with uh, characters pouring in from all directions to create a sort of kaleidoscope of characters. Now, you can only do that on a stage like The Rose and they, eventually The Globe. That, that's why your theatre was so important, because it, it, gave the, it gave a new concept. So not only did it probably have a discovery space at the rear of the stage, it also would have had entrances and exits on either side at the rear, which enabled processions to come in and out and move across the stage. So the movements would be largely circular, or diagonal rather than across or forwards and down. And that is a, a way of creating a sense of a universal drama. And so uh, in the play of Tamburlaine, where you have armies raging across the plains, incidentally, it's, a lot of it is set in Gaza. You think of the Gaza Strip now, the desperate place it is. It so happens that my daughter 
married a man from Gaza, so I visited Gaza on quite a few occasions, and that's an experience which I would rather not share with you because it's too, horrendous, too horrendous. But there's plays to be written about that. But I mean, the, the point is, when you're trying to create a sense of a, a great wilderness, a great desert with characters moving across it, then the big open spaces of the rows are going to make you a playwright and your playwright is going to write plays for that space. And it is that combination of a writer understanding his theatre that's going to create that sort of success. So this is the second point. So we've got his discovery, we've got the entrances and the exits. And then one of the most interesting stage directions, I always think, is the stage direction, Enter Above. <laughs> above, up there somewhere. And there are some wonderful scenes which, in fact, depend upon there having been some form of upper level. The most famous, possibly, is the uh, Jew of Malta. Do you know that play, anyone? Yeah, yeah, right. So Barabbas, the Jew... The Jew has had all his possessions confiscated. His house is turned into a nunnery. The final insult. Unfortunately, all his treasure is concealed between, beneath the floorboard upstairs in the, in the house. What does he do about it? Well, he gets his daughter to become a nun. And then there's this wonderful scene where she appears above, up in the... Up, upstairs, and he calls out the instructions to her to which floorboard to go to to find the treasure. And so the whole thing works by there being an upstairs and a downstairs. Now, you know, we all, all of us at some stage have looked at those pictures of the Globe Theatre. I mean, there is only one, but school, school books are full of pictures of the Globe Theatre, there's some kind of naive idea that by putting a picture of the Globe Theatre in it, children will actually understand Shakespeare more. I've never really quite followed the logic of that, because actually that, that very famous picture of the Globe, you know, of the Swans, right, the Swan Theatre, which is, you know, what we think of, it doesn't actually tell you very much. It's very unhelpful, because there's a row of faces looking out from the gate. Think, well, who are they? Are they the audience? Are they the band? Are they, what are they up there? You know, so we don't really know, let's be honest. But we do know that... Uh, this play uh, will only work if there's a, 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 some kind of gallery at the back of the stage, presumably. So someone needs to get up there. But if you want further illustration of the need for a higher level, then look again at Tamberlin. Because in Tamberlin, uh, the whole of the... When they're outside the, the Damascus, besieging Damascus... The whole edifice really revolves around the idea of the city walls. And there are scenes in which people are hung from the walls and shot from the walls. As you probably know, the only occasion, I think, in the Elizabethan theatre when someone actually died on stage was when uh, someone hanging from the walls of Damascus was literally shot at the orders of Tamberlin, by mistake, of course, the chap misfired the arquebus. But so, the, you know, so, so th there is this intention, and it's very, very difficult, this, to, to mount this scene because you need the idea that the walls are there with all these bodies on it. And so there's got to be some upper level. Now, when I was asked some years ago to direct this play in the grounds of the King's Hall in Canterbury, uh, the, the first thing I asked me to do was to combine part one and part two all into one evening, which took some doing, because each half lasts about three hours. So we sort of condensed it. But then I thought, how, how do we stage this? And I found the only way really to do it was to create a great scaffolding and have the characters moving around on levels of scaffolding, on, on planks. And I do if ever you, any of you remember, I'm sure none of you were so decadent to, to do this, but I used to watch a programme called Gladiators on television where people used to knock each other off with huge punch balls. And do you remember that thing? Yeah. No, of course you don't. Yes, you do. Well, anyway, I, I thought I'd base the production on this because the only way you could, you could get the, the feeling of sheer raw violence was to use people being knocked off those walls and falling down. 
And, and that play is full of the, the need of an upper level. Now, you know, we can speculate about that upper level that we see illustrated on the famous DeWitt picture of the swan and the subsequent drawings and models of the globe. There's been a lot of scholarship, and I'm not going to get into that. I mean, there are whole, now whole organisations devoted to arguing about whether, you know, the back door was one yard to the left or to the right, and people write vitriolic emails to each other <laughs> because they get it wrong, you know. There's actually a new organisation, isn't there, called ART, which stands for Association of Replica Theatres, which, because as you know, there's a bit of a passion these days for building replicas of Elizabethan theatres all around the world. I, the most recent one I visited is where my daughter-in-law comes from, is Gdansk in Poland, and and, um, you know, uh, there's a huge amount of speculation as to, you know, exactly what the dimensions were. Uh, I probably better not get bogged down into that. But the point is that the upper area may have served a number of purposes. Uh, I think it would have done. I mean, any imaginative theatre director will use an upper level for all sorts of different reasons. All we know is that if you want to stage Tamberlin, and he, he, he certainly, when he staged it at the Rose, he certainly needed lots of upper levels uh, because, you know, much of the drama revolves around that. And I'm pretty sure that when he came to write The Jew of Malta, he had that potential in mind, you know, that, he, oh, I must have an upstairs so we can play that scene on two levels. Now, if, if you look at most of his plays, you'll find that there's a huge demand for upper levels. And I suppose while we're talking about levels and above, um, we ought also to talk about the one thing I haven't said in, in a, is trapdoor, is the trapdoor, because lots of it is going down as well. Uh, for example, at the end of Dr. Faustus, he descends to hell, of course, down into some trapdoor, presume, pos presumably, anyway. Um, yeah, so there's not only a, a downwards and an upwards, so th this theatre existed on a whole number of different levels, and that's where the stimulation of the acting comes from. That's why... That's why actors nowadays like this thing called the found space, because, uh, you know, suddenly being sent into a gasworks or into a, new, a place you've never been to or a railway siding to put on a play suddenly opens up all sorts of possibilities. I mean, I must admit, whenever I walk into a room, I think, oh, I could do something in here. You know, I'd quite like to <coughs> stage Dr. Faustus in here. You know, uh, I wouldn't have you all sitting looking at me like that, but I find a way uh, of having that and, and actually on... Next Saturday at the Marlowe Society's meeting in London, we've got a little pub we have to go we go to uh, where we're doing a play, and I've been talking to the actress who's going to do the play, and we've been saying, well, let's find a space within it, and let's find an audience, let's get direct contact. You know, you want that sort of feeling, don't you, of of the rightness of the space. Well, then there's the other. Two other things I want to talk about. I've talked about discovery. I've talked about entrances and exits. I, I've talked about the use of the above. But I think one of the things you, I find most fascinating about all of Marlowe's plays is that they are dense with sound, with sound effects, with in, the use of instruments, the use of instruments to underscore uh, and to make all sorts of interesting uh contributions to the drama. Now, there, there are basically three ways in which Marlowe uses musical instruments. The first, the most obvious, is as a symbol of violence, because trumpets and drums, senets, as they're often called, or flourishes, those two words both mean fanfares of trumpets, uh, drums, uh, they are there to represent kind of military conflict. And the rhythm of the scene is punctuated by percussion. And uh, I think it's very fascinating that if you take any scene from Tamberlin and underscore it with lots of drumming, it suddenly comes alive. You know, it, it actually doesn't work in silence. You've got to have this pounding drumming, throbbing drumming. 
Um, I don't know if any of you have seen the current touring production of Macbeth from the National Theatre. It came to Canterbury the other day, took my grandson to see his first experience of a Shakespeare play, which he loved. Um, again, they brilliantly underscored it with throbbing drums. You know, those throw down, you know, that, that scene, those scenes of battle scenes at the end. I mean, Shakespeare obviously learnt a lot from Marlowe about how to write a battle scene. I mean, I'm not even going to go into it, even touch the authorship problem at the moment. As far as I'm concerned, Marlowe wrote the plays that Marlowe wrote. I mean, that's on today. That's my view today. Um, and, but Marlowe, if you look at Shakespeare's plays, he's, he's writing of battle scenes. They have clearly derived from what Marlowe achieved. You know, or clearly, you know, they, they've benefited from, that, benefited from that kind of input. So yes, that, there's that use of music, that throbbing, that kind of all that sort of drive underneath. But you've also got um, underscored music of a different kind. The death of Xenocrate in Tamburlaine, he calls for solemn music. So we, we know there must have been viols, lutes, viola da gamba perhaps, we don't, we've lost the music, we don't know what the music was, but we know that there was music there. And quite what role it played, uh, we can't be absolutely sure of, but the, without the music, the plays seem bereft. So you, you need to think about how that music was used, where it came from. Some people say that all performances uh, in Elizabethan theatres were announced by the sounding of a trumpet from a high point somewhere who knew the show was about to start. Um, there's all sorts of wonderful expressions like a senate or a parley, that's my favourite. You know what a parley is? Obviously, a parley of instruments, you know, sort of, sort of discourse between instruments. Now, nowadays, people who, who own sort of trendy music groups that play at obscure festivals call themselves a parley of instruments. They? they never call themselves anything like the Pickering Ensemble or anything as boring as that. It was a parley of instruments. Well, if you look at the, uh, the, the, the stage directions here, it talks about a parley from time to time, a group of musicians playing. Um, may, it may well have been, of course, that the players themselves were skilled players of percussion. Um, whether they could play trumpets or not, I don't know. Uh, the other in instruments we get specified are haute boys, which was the oboe, the precursor of the oboe. And um, we, we don't have an actual specification saying the vial, but we're pretty sure the vial is there. I mean, the other thing I suppose to say about the period we're talking about is that you know people say, well, what was the Renaissance in England, in Italy? We know what the Renaissance was. What what was the great skill of the English? What did we contribute to European culture? And most people, I think, would say, who know about this would say it was the lute song, which is our greatest contribution to music. Because the ability, and, and W. H. Auden writes very interestingly on this, pointing out that the, the English language is, is a fine language for setting to the, the simple, short phrases that would be played on a lute. Now, if you try to compare that with to Arabic music, which is uh, accompanied by the oud, uh, which is a very different kind of instrument, you'll, you'll see the difference. The lute underscores short syllables and, and you know, a lot of English poetry is made of short syllabic words without being derogatory about German try setting German as a lute song and you'll see what the problem is it's, it's great as a, as, as, a, as a leader you know it's, but it's not good for the sort of full fathom five thy father lies of his bones, his god all made. Those are pearls that were his eyes. Nothing of him but the. What a gift for a lutinist. You know, because each little phrase can be said. You know, it's a very, very different uh, ball game. Now, I wouldn't claim that Marlowe 
took this to the ultimate extreme. In fact, there's a very fine new book by Professor Shapiro about the authorship. I think it's called something to do with Will anyway, where he points out that actually in Shakespeare's later plays, which are almost certainly performed at the Blackfriars Theatre, and again, this is an example of the relationship between the writing and the theatre, that he uses very extensive music. I mean, The Tempest is absolutely dense with music, much of it instrumental or vocal much of it requiring uh, some uh, pipes and flutes or flute-like instruments. So very, very subtly. So, there, I mean, Marlowe's perhaps set the trend and showed what could be done, but, but he didn't actually develop it as, as well as, as Shakespeare did, certainly in his later plays. Well, now, if you look again at the theatres in which uh, Marlowe's plays were performed, there's one other factor that strikes me all the time and that is the relationship between the actors and the audience now my colleague Ildi Schulte who runs the Mar text she loves to talk about mm -hmm. shared light it's a jargon phrase in other words we're all together in the same light I can see you you can see me yeah, I, I remember once when I was a young actor, I used to perform in the Blue Rinse Matinee at the Winter Gardens Margate, um, which meant that, you know, I the stage would be brightly lit and the auditorium would be in darkness and I would peer out and I might see a couple of heads in the audience, but, you know, I was tempted to go out and say, is there anybody there? Because <laughs> it was a great long theatre, you know, and there was no way that I could establish any kind of rapport with these people other than sort of acting into a void, because that was my idea. And that's why, of course, that kind of theatre tend to invite plays where... Um, the convention is that they're just watching you doing a slice of life on stage. But where this breaks down, of course, and I'm working backwards here, if you go to a pantomime still, you'll get moments that said, what did you say? What's, huh? All right, huh? The aside, as we call it, talking aside to somebody. So you, you only, one moment you're saying, I see you there. Oh, no, I don't. <laughs> what do you think about all this? I bet he's thinking it's rubbish. Um, the aside. Now, actually, I'm not going to claim that Marlowe wrote, invented the aside, but you'll find that there are more asides in Marlowe's plays than any other play that precedes his or virtually follows it. So that's as good as well saying he probably invented it. The use of the aside is very, very familiar uh, in The Jew of Malta, where, and in Dido, Queen of Carthage, where characters are all the time muttering, revealing something about their inner thoughts at the same time as being something else. That, that, it's a bit like that wonderful moment in Macbeth when he says, look like the flower, but be the serpent under it. Look like one thing, but be something else. And if ever you wanted examples of characters who dissemble and who pretend not to, you know, to, to be something other, look at the Jew of Malta, for example. Look, at, look in Dido. Um, let's see if I can find, where is the actual one? I can actually give you the, the very one in Dido. Line 60, page 66. I've been directing a scene from this play. Dido, Queen of Carthage. Do you know this play? Yeah. Oh, it's quite a tricky play. It's a, quite a pretty play. Right. And line 60. It says, it says, Dido, page 66, line 60. Yeah. Right. Okay, so what's going on here is... Uh, Dido is dying of love. I mean, it's just so simple. What's actually happened is Aeneas has been told by the gods or the goddesses he's got to leave Dido. He forsakes Dido. She dies of love. She eventually runs into the fire, commits suicide. It's a scene which is very much like the death of Cleopatra um, in Antony and Cleopatra, but I think superior. Um, 
and I think it's a wonderful moment. And she's waited on by Anna. And Diodos says, Because his loathsome sight offends mine eye, and in my thoughts is shrined another love. Oh, Anna, didst thou know how sweet love were? Full soon wouldst thou abjure this single life. And she says, Poor soul, I know too well the sour of love. In other words, you might think that I don't know, but I do know. So she shares her inner thought. Now, what I think is so fascinating about the kind of drama that Marlowe wrote is that although these are early examples, he somehow has a way of showing the inner life of the characters. And that is what makes drama riveting. It's not the great declamations. It's not the fact that, you know, when, that Tamberlin can soar the air with great speeches, which are wonderful. It's not that Faustus will say, was this the face that launched a thousand ships and burnt the topless towers of Ilium? Sweet Helen, make me immortal with a kiss. Her lips suck forth my soul. I mean, that's pretty good stuff. Uh, and things like that, you know, um, when Tamberlin, you know, speaks over the dying Xenocrity. I mean, it is one of the most moving speeches. But this great oratory is nothing compared with the inner life of the characters that are revealed within the action. And that's often done through asides, through the tiniest remarks. And I don't know how, how much you perhaps understand that. I'm not being condescending, but I'm, I'm not sure how rich or varied your theatrical experiences but I must tell you I mustn't name drop but I, went, I was in a production some years ago directed by a, a very famous Polish director and uh, we were in a play called Wojciech and uh, he, he set one of the actors the part of, of Wojciech and he worked very hard at it and the director said Roger all I see is Roger trying to be Wojciech. I do not see the inner life of Wojciech. Poor Roger. I mean, what a put down. <laughs> I wasn't actually that up and unhappy, actually. And Roger was rather pleased with himself a lot of the time. But anyway, um, the fact is that, you know, it is the revealing of the inner life of characters. So, in a way, if we go back to where we begin, at the beginning of Dr. Faustus, you know, and he's in his study, sitting there, and he's surrounded by books. Settle thy study, Faustus, and begin to sound the depth of that thou wilt profess. Having commenced to be a divine in show, yet level at the end of every art, and live and die in Aristotle's works, sweet analytics, tis thou has ravished me. You know, he's sharing this inner life with you. And then he takes you on his journey, because at that point he then begins to explain that actually each of these philosophies, each of these things he's read have proved inadequate, that they're not what he hoped they were. He'd built them up, but no, he's got to go further. He's got to find some, something beyond. So he despairs of theology. He despairs and eventually comes down to magic, to black magic, to, to divining spirits, you know. And so that's why um, there's this sort of sense of the journey of his soul and then when he, he gets into dialogue with Mephistopheles, who, of course, was a, was a fallen angel, you know, and then and, and, why, this is hell. 
nor are we out of it. Yeah. I think hell's a fable, says Faust. Oh, no, why? This is hell, nor are we out of it. Thinks thou that I who saw the face of God are not tempted, are not tormented with ten thousand hells for being deprived of everlasting bliss? Don't you think I have felt hell every minute of my life? You suddenly feel sorry for the devil. I mean, that's what's amazing. You identify, you actually understand when it feels to be the fallen angel. I, who saw the face of God, you know, and now being chucked down. And think of the way Olgar does that in the dream of Gerontius. Chucked down, chucked down, chucked down, you know, according to you know, the poetry. So what if, um, our playwright is able to do it seems to me, is to use this theatre, use this space, use this architecture, use this shape to engage with his audience, to show huge dramas, but to show small personal dramas at the same time, to show the, the progress of nations and empires at the same time as showing the, the progress of a conscience, all within the use of this space, also showing us how people can wound each other, how they can love each other, how they can care for each other, how they can be so cruel to each other, how they can create a Syria, how they can do all of those things and yet also can create bliss and understand all these things. And he does all this in these big open theatres with their, with their discovery spaces, with their entrances and exits, all these things that enable the actors to work in them. Now, what we don't know, of course, is precisely where Marlowe's plays went on tour. Uh, there, there are records of several companies that did tour. We know, for example, that quite a lot of Shakespeare's Kingsmen's company came to Canterbury to perform country, in Canterbury. We, we do know that. Precisely where, we're not too sure. There, there, there are records of it. The same will be true of Marlowe in many places, but we've got actually rather flimsy records of how he adapted this, the plays for other spaces. But what I'm pretty sure is, is that the sheer stagecraft of the plays enables them to work almost in any empty and open space you can find with a few levels. You know, it doesn't require the sort of illusions that, so, that some plays do. Uh, and it, it doesn't require technicality. What it does require are spectacular sounds, spectacular effects, very, very, very physical play, and great deal of sound and, mu and music. The physicality of the plays is almost overwhelming. Uh, and I'll finish here. With last two years, two years ago, we performed The Massacre at Paris, which is a dreadful play because of 23 murders on stage <laughs> throughout the play uh, all in the space of an hour and a half um, 23 murders in fact I did once see a production of I Digress who they literally every time the was went one two three <laughs> so you counted them because it, it was so laughable they keep dying and of course uh, whoever wrote down the play at one point gets it wrong so the wrong person kills the wrong person um, but anyway the sheer physical dexterity that was required of the cast to perform that play in the crypt of Canterbury Cathedral is where we did it. Uh, the sounds were really ghostly in there uh, because I have actually acted in that space before. In fact, I'm the, I think I'm the last English actor to have been murdered in the cathedral um, <laughs> nightly and that I shall never forget lying on that cold stone floor for the whole of Act Two, as it were, waiting a be carted off, having been murdered quite early on, as you know, in the play. Um, but anyway, the, the, the sheer, the, the training that we had to give the actors in physical theatre was quite revealing. I was surprised by, you know, we had to teach them all forms of combat, lots and lots of violence. And of course, the play is full of every conceivable form of death. Poison porridge, poison gloves, poison this, poison that, daggers going here, swords going here. You know, I mean, all sorts of horrendous ways of d doing away with your enemy. Um, and yet you somehow have to make it not tedious. How do you do, you know, all those over 20 murders without boring the pants off people? You know, Agatha Christie gets away with one. <laughs> you know, how do you get away with 
or over 20. Well, all I can say is the man's stagecraft was superb. <coughs> and if it's true, and it, it is speculative, if it's true that the text that's come down to us is really a memorised text from actors, because it, it is so full of inconsistency, then it just goes to show how much they like that play, that they could actually remember it and put it together from memory. Uh, to tour later on, because you probably know that there was a, a huge amount of um, coming and going as regards theatre tours and so on because of the plague and the closing of the theatres by the Puritans and so on. So, you know, play, plays were up and then they were running, then they weren't, now they're there, now they're there. You know, it, it wasn't an easy life running a theatre company. And Marlowe's theatre company, the one he wrote, wrote for, were subject to all sorts of changes. Well, I hope I've given you just a, a little insight into the way your theatre that's why you're here you're rose people aren't you uh, and you know you're the champions of the rose long may it survive and flourish looking forward to when there's a loo there uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, but anyway all the very best with your with your future I hope that's whetted your appetite for Marlowe in your own theatre thank you very much thank you. He said that he would also take some questions. Yeah, of course. Um, but he does have a train to catch to get back to Canterbury. But before we do that, could I just mention that the Jewel Malta and Dr. Faustus will be two of the six plays we're going to do at our fifth readathon, which will be on the 11th of May at the Rose. And do look out on our website for all the information. But those two plays will be um, ones that you could come and take part in. You get your name out of a hat and you read that site. And it's a very wonderful experience alongside the, the Ruins of the Rose. Yes, it's lovely, lovely experience. Well, Ken played Tamblyn for us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was great. Very, very well indeed. So, have you got some questions? Anyone? Yes. David. Thank you. When was the first collection of Marlowe's plays published? Published? <laughs> uh, the first collection of his plays was published well after his death, in about 1700. You know, it's well, well after his death. Uh, in... in Individual plays were appearing uh, throughout uh, the latter half of the 16th century, but um, it, it was a long time before anyone collected them. No one did for Marlowe what they did for Shakespeare. There was no folio edition. And that's been one of the problems, to be honest. They've come down to us in all various forms, yeah. But by the time we got to the 19th century, I know there's a long gap, but I mean, people like Tennyson were, were saying that, you know, this, is, this man is the morning star. This is the greatest writer of, our, of in our language. We often forget that. <laughs> you know, that, uh, that actually there, there was... Uh, the, there's all sorts of reasons why Marlowe's plays are because they're not famous. I mean, I, mean, I, I shouldn't, shouldn't digress too much, but Canterbury, I mean, it's taken a long time to acknowledge Marlowe because they're embarrassed by him. A, because there's the rumours of his atheism, which is not is what you want in a cathedral city. Uh, and B, you know, he, his supposed homosexuality, although it's not proven, but there's a suggestion. You know. So, I, I mean, I only read a book a couple of weeks ago from someone who visited Canterbury, apparently in the 1950s, and went into the, you know, the uh, tourist office and said, well, can you tell me about Marlowe? said, oh, we don't talk about Marlowe here. <laughs> <laughs> now we're desperate to get him on the map, you know. We've, we've, we've got a, a, Marlow, a sort of Marlowe centre called The Kit now in Canterbury. We've got Marlowe Theatre, of course. And um, not that we'll ever do any plays by Marlowe. That's, well, it, not until we kicked their bottoms two years ago, and they did. Maybe Theatre and Marlowe the together. Oh, I think they should, yeah, I, I think absolutely, and um, whatever the relationship between the two, and, you know, people get very hot on the collar about that, um, there clearly is a lot of common ground there, yeah. I mean, it's fascinating all this, uh, you know, the assignment of some of the Henry VI plays to Marlowe now, you know, the, the latest Oxford Shakespeare says the Henry VI plays are written by Marlowe, quite categorically. People are now... Uh, arguing about Arden of Faversham as whether I mean Arden Faversham is the next town up the road from Canterbury and um, Marlowe's family would have seen the execution of the murderers of Arden in, so yet someone says oh no Marlowe didn't write Arden of Faversham the local story is pretty 
sort of a good deal of suggestion he could well have done. It's a very, it's a huge field which I've deliberately avoided a bit. But you're happy to happy to prize me open on it. <laughs> any, yes. Yeah, we, don't, we don't hear of Mara cooperating and writing along with any other writers. It's very fashionable now to bring out in Shakespeare and. and yes. And yes. Um, no, that's perfectly true. We don't, but a lot of people think. Uh, well, there are two things I, I could say about that. One is that Kidd and Marlowe you know, shared digs and they lived together. And there was a problem there because Kidd, under torment, under torture, w w confessed that Marlowe was writing atheistic tracts and so on. So it was a great sort of split between them. Uh, we now, as I said, th this new, new assignment studies, which do it through an algorithm on a computer, demonstrated that Marlowe certainly contributed to the Henry VI plays. Um, there are people who are convinced that Marlowe contributed to others. This latest book by Shapiro that came out only this year called something like Radical Will or something like Contested that. Will. Contested Will. Contested Will is, is a beautiful book. Uh, he, he looks rather more at the Oxfordian than the Baconians than the people who say that Marlowe wrote Shakespeare. But um, there's some very interesting material about that sort of collaboration. No, but the, you're quite right. We don't talk about him a lot as a collaborator. But because for most people, he stopped writing when he disappeared in Deptford, you know. Um, but there are people who contest that whole incident. There's a lot of scholarship around that whole coroner's report that makes it look very dodgy, to be honest. Now, whether Marlowe really was... Uh, smuggled away as I mean I've got a friend strange enough, who, who worked for MI6 and I was telling him about one of the conspiracy theories about Marlowe and he said well yes of course of course he, he could have easily been spirited away that's the way it's often happened dozens of people have been made to disappear but whether you know In that, I, I saw a play once called Yes, yes yeah. where it was suggested that he thought he was going to be spirited away, but he killed him instead. Yes, <laughs> that's right. I, I, I cannot come down on any one side. There's masses of le le reading to do around it. The most fascinating reading, I think, is about the coroner's report and the likely reliability of that. And that's, the, that's the most interesting. The other thing I find absolutely fascinating is all this business about why Marlowe's degree was withheld and then, then suddenly awarded because he'd been engaged in his on Her Majesty's service abroad, and what was he up to? Well, for example, I'll give you one example that I find very fascinating, which may or may not be true, is that there's a good deal of evidence that whoever wrote the play Edward III, no one knows who wrote Edward III, some people say Marlowe, some people say Shakespeare, whoever wrote that clearly based one scene on an account of the Spanish Armada. I mean, it is almost, it, it is almost word for word the, the description of the official report of how the Armada fought, which is still in the, in, in the, the records, OK? Now, a lot of people have looked at this and have come to the conclusion that Marlowe himself was on board a ship called the Nonpareil in the Armada campaign as... A, a spy watching the activities of the Armada, and he was the person who wrote this uh, a report of, of the activity of the Armada. There's, there's a lot, of, a lot of scholarship around that, which is very fascinating, as to whether Marlowe did witness the Armada or was, was actually on board the Armada. Uh, that's one very fascinating thing. Um, I said the, the other thing so about his apparent lack of collaboration with others is that if, if by any chance uh, he was spirited away and wrote plays uh, anonymously or contributed, he, he wouldn't have wanted it to be known that his name was there. But, yeah, it's a very tricky one. There's, there's masses to read on it if you want to. My wife is the most ardent reader of Marlowe conspiracy theories. Every day she comes up with a new one. <laughs> yes, yeah, they are fascinating. I mean, that's fascinating. <laughs> Any other questions? Like anything? Else? Have I exhausted you? By? <laughs>
nothing has been so comprehensive. But then you came to talk to us tonight about Marlowe's stagecraft and the way in which it would bring alive his plays, and particularly as our beloved Rose. But I think you brilliantly tonight also brought the plays alive for us. Thank you. Thank you. I think we, we really enjoyed hearing about it, and I think we can thank him again. Thank you. For me. Thank you very much.